Ladies and gentlemen, the organization of Arab students and the committee on lecture in Iowa State University welcome you to this lecture. Our guest tonight is Mr. Hassan Rahman. Mr. Hassan Rahman was born in Palestine, 1944, graduated from the Catholic University of Puerto Rico in political sciences, got his master's degree in public administration from the State University of Puerto Rico. He was a PhD candidate in the City University of New York. Mr. Hassan Abdurrahman represented the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, in the Social and humani Humanitarian Comi Committee in the United Nations. Presently, he is the acting director in the Info Information Office for the PLO in the United States and the deputy permanent representative of the PLO to the United Nations. The lecture topic tonight is Palestine, the key to peace in the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hassan Rahman. At the outset, I would like to thank the Organization of Arab Students and the Committee on Lectures in the State University of Iowa for allowing me the opportunity of being with you here this evening. In order to understand what is we mean by the question of Palestine and how Palestine can be the key to Middle East peace, we have to distinguish between two aspects of the Middle East conflict. Those two aspects are distinct from each other, yet they are interrelated. They are separated, but they are organically connected. The first aspect of the Middle East conflict that which refers to the occupation of territories that belong to two Arab states by Israel, namely Egypt and Syria. In other words, the relations or the interstate relations that exist between the government as it is established of Israel and the governments of Egypt and Syria over the occupation of the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. Now the other aspect of the problem and that which refers to the dispossession of the national rights of the Palestinian people, their usurpation uh, and their uprooting from their homes and properties. And that's why it is not a question of territory as far as the Palestinians are concerned only. It is a question of national inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. This second aspect is the essence of the Middle East conflict. And it is the core. And therefore, no solution can be achieved for the Middle East conflict without solving the second aspect that I spoke about, and that is the Palestine question. Namely, the restoration of the national rights of the Palestinian people, their repatriation to their homes and properties, and the reconstruction of their collective identity as a people. And in order to uh, become more familiar with what I am saying, I like to give just a selection of historical facts about the nature and the character of the Palestinian-Israeli Zionist conflict. 
we have been here in the West misled to believe that the question of Palestine is a question of refugees. And therefore, it has to be dealt with as such. And in fact, the government of Israel, as well as the government of the United States until very recently, have conceived of the problem in those terms. Uh, up to the now, the government of Israel believes and still insists that the problem of the Palestinians is a refugee problem. And therefore, since they are refugees, their problem has to be dealt with as such. In other words, to resettle them somewhere else without taking in consideration their national inalienable rights. And the other misconception that we have been led to believe, at least in the West, and this is due to the way that the media have handled the problem of the uh, Palestinian people, uh, that it is a religious conflict, that it is a conflict between the Jews on one side and the non-Jews in the Middle East on the other hand, which of course is not true because as we are on record in the Middle East, there has never been any persecution of any religious group in the Middle East because of their religious affiliation. Our culture is known to be one of the most tolerant cultures. We have always coexisted, Christians, Muslims, Jews, together without any discrimination whatsoever until Zionism was introduced into the Middle East. Now, we have also to establish that when we talk about Zionism, we talk about the concrete political ideology of Zionism that is distinguished and distinct from Judaism. Judaism for us is a religion like any other religion, and we conceived of it, treated as such, we revered it, and we respect it in the same way that we respect Christianity and Islam. Zionism is a concrete political ideology that was founded in Europe to respond to certain problems that existed in Europe, which is also alien to the realities and necessities of the Middle East. And I'll come to this a little later. Now the third misconception that we have been led to believe also, that the conflict in the Middle East is an Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, it is between the Arabs on one side and the Jews on the other side, which is also not true because as I mentioned before, the conflict is basically between the Palestinian people in the first place and Zionism and the involvement of the Arabs, Arab states, in that conflict came as a, co uh, a, a consequence to the basic conflict between Palestinians and Israeli Zionists. So those are the three basic misconceptions about the nature of the conflict in the Middle East. And unless they are corrected and put into the right context, it becomes very difficult to deal with how to solve the problem in the Middle East. Now Zionism, as I mentioned before, was established in Europe. It came as a reaction to the treatment that the Jews suffered in Europe uh, after the Dreyfus case where the Jews uh, felt concretely that they have been persecuted and discriminated against in Europe because they happen to be Jews. A fact that is condemned by every human being who believes in justice and who have not 
conceived of justice in a double standard. Because when we talk about justice in the Palestine Liberation Organization, we believe in justice for the Palestinian Arabs as well as the Jews. And for every single human being, regardless of his race, color, sex, or whatever it is. We believe in, in, in the visibility of justice. And that's why in our struggle and in the solutions we offer to the Middle East conflict, we include those who are of the Jewish faith who happen to live now in the Middle East, regardless whether they have been misled, whether they came as settlers, as colonials, uh, regardless of the capacity and the form they immigrated to the Middle East and settled there, in our program, we include every single one of them. Now, in the first Zionist Congress held in Baal, Switzerland, in 1897, the Zionist movement decided that Palestine should be the homeland for the Jews. In Palestine then, about 950,000 Palestinian Arabs, mainly Christians and Muslims, and about 50,000 Jews lived in Palestine. The people who decided that Palestine should be the homeland for the Jews are European, who had problems in Europe uh, in the same way that many other minorities had problems. Legally or morally, they did not have any right to claim in Palestine. Most of them have never set foot on Palestine before. Uh, so they did not have any right to claim in Palestine because they happen to be Jews. Uh, they could have, in the same way the Armenians have done before, uh, immigrated into Palestine as immigrants uh, who seek to coexist with the indigenous population, live with them as people, not as a movement that have as it is main goal the usurpation of the land of the Palestinian, their uprooting, and the establishment uh, of a Jewish homeland, which in other words mean a state, in their place. So the conflict between the Palestinians and the Zionists was over this. That the Zionist movement is a colonial movement that intended to establish an exclusive Jewish homeland in Palestine at the expense of the indigenous population of Palestine, which, is, uh, which are the Palestinian Arabs, and mainly the Christians and Muslims of Palestine. A fact that the Palestinian people resisted from the very beginning, of course the Zionist movement uh, in its attempt to manipulate international public opinion, have told the world that Palestine was a land without people and should be given for people without <coughs> land. Uh, a Jewish thinker, his name was Ahad Ha'am, who visited Palestine in 1881 even, said when he heard that slogan raised by the Zionists, he said, I visited Palestine and I found not one acre of land that was arable that has not been cultivated by the native population. In fact, Palestine in 1918 used to produce about 20 million boxes of oranges and export them to Europe. So it is not true what the Zionist movement have been telling the international public opinion that Palestine was a desert and one of their miracles was to make the desert bloom and that they have created a paradise in Palestine. Palestine is known to be one of the most fertile lands of the Middle East. It has one of the longest histories of the world, and it has produced one of the most strong, viable, and continuous civilizations in the world. And the Palestinian people have always existed in Palestine, worked in Palestine, uh, helped to develop uh, themselves and the international community. 
in within their uh, limited resources. But of course, the Zionist movement knew then that they are unable to achieve this goal without outside help. So what they did was first to appeal to the leading colonial power then, and that was England. They appealed to England uh, to help them in, uh, in, in their efforts to establish this exclusive Jewish state in Palestine. But the British could not, at the beginning, do anything because Palestine was uh, under the uh, Ottoman control and the Arabs were rising up against Turkish imperialism, Turkish colonialism of Palestine, and struggling for their independence. And England had an interest in supporting the Arabs in order to defeat Turkey. In order, of course, that it was revealed later, to divide the Middle East among themselves, among them and the French, a fact that had been materialized later on uh, as a result for the Sykes-Picot Agreement which, in which England took control over Palestine, Jordan, uh, and Iraq. In exchange, France took control over Syria and Lebanon. And the Zionist movement found it the only one who would help the Zionist movement in getting England to provide this help to them was Cecil Rhodes. Now, Cecil Rhodes is the founder of modern Rhodesia. He looked through the Zionist project and said, well, this is very similar to what we are doing now in South Africa, and therefore, we are going to support it. He recommended the support of that program to the British government, and in 1917, we the Zionist movement succeeded in getting uh, England to issue the infamous Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was supposed to uh, commit the British government to the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. By 1917, the uh, First World War was almost over and the Allies were uh, victorious in the war. Uh, England and France decided to have the Middle East divided among them. As I mentioned before, France would take over Syria and Lebanon. England will have a mandate over Palestine. And I say mandate because it was, Palestine was developed enough that England could not assume colonization of Palestine. And in, in, in the language, international law language, a mandate means that England will help the indigenous population, the native people of Palestine, to develop themselves to the extent where they become uh, capable of handling their own affairs, which means that their role will be, be a leading role for the Palestinians to become self-sufficient and achieve their independence. A trust that the British betrayed because their intention was never to help the Palestinians and their intention was to fulfill the promise that they gave to the Zionists through the Balfour Declaration. The first thing was that England appointed a Zionist as the High Commissioner in Palestine, Sir Herbert Samuel in 1924, whose role was to facilitate the immigration of Jews into Palestine. That was his main task. But the Palestinian people uh, never just stood there with their hand crossed and they resisted uh, British mandate over Palestine. The British, they, they never chose even the mandate for themselves. Uh, it was done by imposition on them uh, they fought in 1921 in a massive uprising in Palestine, led by the Congress of All of Palestine then, a, a political organization that was formed to combat 
uh, British colonialism and Zionism, uh, Zionist immigration. In 1924, they led another movement. In 1929, there was a major revolt in Palestine against the British and the Zionists protesting the settlements uh, of the uh, uh, Jews in Palestine and the illegal immigration, quote unquote, that was allowed by the British. And in 1929, the British government reacted by hanging 15 uh, leaders of the Palestinian movement publicly in the squares of Gaza, Akka, Yaffa, and Haifa in order to intimidate the native population in Palestine. Now at this point, I would like just to draw your attention to one uh, fact. While the British were allowing Zionists to come and settle in Palestine, they were allowing them also to establish their own exclusive infrastructure in the, in the country. Uh, for example, the, the settlement of the land, uh, wherever they, they bought or acquired land with the help of the British, they would establish exclusive Jewish colonies on this land. Palestinians could never work on that land. Uh, they would establish schools that were exclusive for the Jews. They would establish banks that the Palestinians could not work in or have uh, transaction with. So the, it, they were creating a society parallel to the existing society and in its place, in other words. That the, the more land they take, they would establish Jewish institutions on that land, their political organizations, their trade unions, everything that they brought into Palestine was exclusively Jewish. And the British government helped to create paramilitary organizations for the Zionists. They would allow them to train themselves, have paramilitary schools. At the same time, any Palestinian who was caught with a knife that exceeded three inches would be sentenced to 15 years in prison. Uh, there was a process of, a, a systematic process of maintaining the Palestinian people, Christians and Muslims, uh, ignorant. Uh, no schools were allowed, no streets was supposed to be open, etc., etc. So the British were playing, on one hand, a role of maintaining the Palestinians or uh, uh, pushing them to surrender their land and their identity, and at the same time, constructing a, a, the adequate conditions for the Zionist movement to establish itself in Palestine. And the last major revolt by the Palestinians was in 1936, when the Palestinian people revolted for three years, liberated about 80% of the total of Palestine, and the British was almost defeated to the extent where they had to call into Palestine 120,000 soldiers, which formed one third of their total army, the army of England. Uh, but they could not even succeed in uh, uh, crushing the Palestinian revolution until 1939 when the Second World War started. Now, in 13, uh, 1939, England uh, negotiated with the leaders of the Palestinian Revolution and told them that now we have a common threat, and that is Nazism in Europe, and they issued what became known as the White Paper. The White Paper was supposed to end illegal Jewish immigration into Palestine. Uh, it was a promise by the government of England to uh, once the war is over, we grant the Palestinians their right to self-determination and independence. A fact that was also betrayed immediately after the Second World War. Now, during the Second World War, a very important uh, event took place, and that is in Palestine, among the Jews was formed the Jewish Brigade to fight alongside the allies in the Second World War. Now the Palestinians applied to join in this with the British. They were not allowed. They never understood until later 
because this was to become the nucleus of the Zionist terrorist groups that conducted the war of terror against the Palestinians once the war was over. By 1945, when the war was over, they were already uh, the nucleus in, in for the, uh, the, is the Jewish uh, organizations, Zionist organizations, uh, who conducted a war uh, of terror against the Palestinians and against certain sectors of the British mandatory forces that did not want to collaborate with the Zionists. A major, during the war, one uh, incident took place. And that in New York, in the Biltmore Hotel in 1942, the Zionist movement and their general congress decided to abolish the term homeland and establish instead a Jewish state in Palestine. So the decision to create a state of Israel was not made by the Jews in Palestine. It was made in the Biltmore Hotel in New York City, decided by American Jews and other Jews, uh, an irony which uh, is also very significant because as we see now that the financiers of Israel has always been either the Jewish community in the United States or the government of the United States. Uh, of course, through a process of uh, exploitation of the American taxpayer, who gives to the government of Israel about $3 billion a year in armaments, mainly phantom jets and tanks. And all of you know that phantom jets are not used for tourist excursions, and tanks are not used to cultivate land. They are used to destroy and kill. And <coughs> Our people ask themselves this question, why the American people uh, do that? Of course, we understand that most of the Americans do not know exactly what happened with their money that they pay as taxes. Uh, they don't know that every single Israeli, whether child, man, or woman, gets about $1,000 a year tax exempt, and I don't know how many Americans get that amount from their government. But this is for the Americans, of course, to decide. <coughs> but as I said, the, the fact that the decision was made in the in Biltmore Hotel in the United States is very significant uh, because this was a commitment. This, was, this meant that the thrust of the Zionist movement is not in Europe anymore, and it was transferred to the United States. Uh, which is a fact now, you know, even, even present Israeli officials, when they want to campaign for an office in Israel, they don't run in Israel, they usually come and pay a visit to New York because that's where they have the coverage, they have the money to pay for their campaigns. Uh, Eric Sharon, for example, who's a candidate for, the, for one of the, uh, for the prime minister in Israel now, was asked the other day on television why uh, you come to the United States to campaign. He said, because whatever I do in the United States is reported in the Israeli press. What I do in Israel is not reported in the Israeli press. So I mean, this is why, uh, and we know that there is a definite commitment by the uh, Zionist organizations in the United States to the power they have and because uh, of the influence they have in the United States, they have been the main supplier of Israel. But anyway, uh, <coughs> 1945, as I said, immediately after 1945, after the Second World War, the Zionist movement led a war of terror against the Palestinians. During the 30 years between 1917 to 1947, England have succeeded in upsetting the balance of power to the favor of the Zionists. In the sense that while the Palestinians were kept without any real power through a systematic process of, uh, of uh, t 
taking power away from them. The, at the same time, the British authorities were allowing any uh, Zionist to go anywhere in the world, import any amount of weapons they felt was necessary and tolerable. By 1947, when England knew that the balance of power is not in the favor of the Palestinians, they raised their hands and said, well, we cannot deal with the situation in Palestine, and they turned it to the United Nations to deal with. The United Nations uh, was mainly dominated by Western powers, uh, allies that were victorious in the Second World War. Uh, third World countries were not uh, uh, a power in the United Nations. The countries that were members of the United Nations were mainly Latin American countries that are within the orbit of domination of Western powers. And they had an interest in, in, in uh, recommending the kind of solution they recommended. Now the solution that the United Nations came up with was the partition of Palestine. Legally, the United Nations have no right to infringe on the territorial integrity of any state. Uh, the United Nations have no right, according to its charter, to recommend the partition of any country. The United Nations have only the right to recommend the right of self-determination to a certain group of people, but they do not have the right to recommend the partition of a country. The Palestinian people rejected uh, the partition on the grounds that this is their homeland. Uh, their ancestors' homeland, it is their patria, and they would not allow it is partition under no circumstances. But of course, as I said, the balance of power was in favor of the Zionist movement. And uh, through the war they conducted and waged against the Palestinian people, they succeeded. The Palestinians were two-thirds of the population in Palestine, and one-third were Jews. Now, in the 56%, there was supposed to be 410,000 Arabs living there. And according to the resolution, partition resolution, that the laws of this state to be established, the Jewish state, should not affect in no way the rights and interests of the non-Jewish community. <coughs> but of course, the, uh, the leaders of the uh, Zionist terrorist organizations, uh, they did not have in mind uh, the, to allow any Palestinian to remain. So what they did, they uh, conducted a war of intimidation at the beginning. Uh, one example of this was the massacre of Deir Yassin in April 9, 1948, when the Ergon, led by Menachem Begin, who by the way is now the leader of the Likud bloc in the Israeli Knesset, entered the village of Deir Yassin, massacred 254 Palestinians, mainly children and women, and went to the streets of other villages saying, if you don't leave, your fate will be that of the people of Deir Yassin. And of course, the Palestinians, like any other people, they, some of them are afraid for their lives, they left. And others were pushed to, and especially those who left to Lebanon, because they closed the territory, the, the, the land uh, uh, ways for them, and they opened just the sea to leave from the Mediterranean to Haifa, Yafa, Akka into Lebanon. So by 1948, Israel controlled, after the establishment of the state, which by the way was recognized 10 minutes later by the late Truman, uh, controlled over 70% of Palestine instead of the 56 that was supposed to be allocated to them even according to the unjust and unfair uh, partition resolution. 
And the last of Palestine in 1949 was annexed to Jordan or was uh, uh, taken control over by Jordan. Palestine ceased to exist as a political identity while the Palestinian people remained as a people, scattered uh, all over the Arab world. And those who remained in what was left from Palestine uh, remained under Jordanian domain. One part of Palestine that was administered by Egypt, and that's Gaza Strip, was never formally annexed to Egypt, was left as the only territories of Palestine that was not formally part of any other Arab state, but was under the administration of Egypt. What happened in 1948 was really the destruction of the national leadership of the Palestinian people, which of course was to an extent have failed to protect the interests of the Palestinians. And the Palestinians started to search for conventional Arab organizations that would, according to their understanding, probably help to redeem them, in, in a way to restore their rights of them. They became Ba'athists, uh, they became Nasserites, they became all uh, uh, the, in, in the, the, they tried to fit in all the existing ideologies in the Arab world, which failed. By 1965, the Palestinian people decided to create their own political organization, uh, and that was the Palestine National Liberation Movement, which became, which is known now as Fatah, uh, that led the first military operation against Israel, June 1st, 1965. One year before then, the PLO was established, uh, which was supposed to represent all the, the different factions of the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian people. Uh, there were certain objections by certain organizations to, an, uh, to the PLO, which was reformed later on in 1968. But in order not to continue with my monologue, I, I would like just to conclude uh, at this stage, hoping that you will have some questions to ask and that we could deal with uh, concretely with certain aspects of the, the complex. Now, what are the aims uh, and goals of the PLO? Well, the PLO became, first of all, recognized by the Palestinian people as their sole and legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Then it became recognized by the Arab states in this capacity. The Islamic Conference in 1974 also recognized the PLO. The non-aligned movement recognized the PLO. And in 1974, the United Nations recognized the PLO as the sole and legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Well, the goal of the PLO is first to achieve the right of return to Palestinian refugees to their homes and properties in Palestine. And second, the establishment of an independent sovereign Palestinian state. Those are the two goals for which the Palestine Liberation Organization struggles. Our vision is to have a secular democratic state in Palestine where all people, regardless of their faith, race, sex would be equal citizens this is an alternative to the existing uh, exclusive Jewish state now that discriminates against people because they happen to be of a non-Jewish faith. Our 
answer to exclusivism is universalism. We believe that in the long run, the people in the Middle East, regardless of their faith, have to become one people in order to end the condition of the ghetto in which the Jewish people now live in Palestine because they are isolated from the mainstream of human thought. And we would like them to become, or first of all, liberate themselves from uh, the Zionism uh, as an ideology that isolates them from uh, the rest of humanity. Because according to Zionism, uh, the Jews, regardless of wherever they are, they are not part of the uh, societies in which they are born. And they have the, as long as they live outside of Israel, they are living on the leftovers of the Gentiles. And therefore, the Zionist movement become oppressive twice. Once it calls upon the Jew to uproot himself from wherever he is. And second, instead, in order to create a place for him, a Palestinian should be uprooted. So it is against the Palestinian in one hand, it, and also it is against the Jew in the other hand, because it calls for the Jews to feel themselves as a minority always in any uh, society where they are ever present. We are against that, and we believe that uh, our allegiance, uh, first of all, is uh, to humanity. We are part of the human race. We have our own distinct culture, but it is not superior or inferior to any. It is equal to any other culture. We hope that our goals uh, can be realized. What encourages us more than anything else is the fact that there are many thousands of Jews who are joining our ranks and files and have a basic agreement with our program. Those Jews either live in Israel or outside Israel. Uh, and uh, this led lately to the formation of the Democratic Front in Israel, which is running together Arabs and Jews, Palestinian Arabs and Jews, <coughs> uh, as candidates. Uh, for the in, the in the upcoming elections in Israel. This is very encouraging to us. It shows that the movement of history is always forward and not backward, uh, and that Zionism is an archaic, anti-historic movement because it goes against the movement of history. We are aware of the, all the conflicts that existed and still exist. We do not pretend that the solution for those problems that came as a result of years or decades of, of conflict will be solved overnight. We believe that the, the integration between the Jews and the non-Jews Palestinian Arabs, Christians, and Muslims is a process in itself. Some may say that this is very hard to achieve. And I would like just to quote one famous Jewish thinker who said, this could be a dream, but at least those who do not have the power to dream cannot have the power to live. And we, the Palestinian people, have the power to dream. Thank you.